Early morning. A young sambar deer looks up from its dawn meal. Flocks of parakeets move from the forest where they slept to the grasslands where they'll forage for seeds. A monitor lizard moves into the safety of the forest undergrowth. A hornbill glides to a treetop and perches, preening. A snail moves slowly, silently along a tree trunk, searching for tiny edible plants and microorganisms. Below ground, the buttress roots of a 300-year-old Tamellus nudifolia push millions of tiny root hairs into the forest soil, searching for moisture and nutrients. Dragonflies dance over river riffles, looking for insect prey while whistling ducks bob for the dragonfly's young in a river eddy nearby. Glowing bracket funguses feed on a dead tree branch, releasing its nutrients to the forest soil. Another turn of the earth in the succession of days and nights, of millennia and ages that have shaped these creatures in this place. Here in this wild ecosystem, evolving still after more than tens of millions of years, is a storehouse of information that would overwhelm the largest computers. The genetic information of millions of creatures, each with its own strategies for growth, body shape, reproduction, nutrition, competition, cooperation, hunting, hiding, and protection from disease. Wild places like this shaped our own upright bodies, our fingers, our versatile tongues and horizon-scanning eyes, our agile, probing minds. When we are in wild places like this, there are moments when our senses surge, our spirits sing as something deep inside reconnects and rejoices, remembering that this is our home. Complex, interconnected, interdependent, diverse, ancient, and full of information. Here in the wild, the song of all Earth's creatures is still sung. It's our song, too. I'm on one of the lakes at Katyan National Park. In Vietnam, lowland forests and wetlands like this are rare. They only exist here. Katyan is a protected area in the south of Vietnam. And this place is the place of preservation for lowland forest. To reach Katyan National Park, one leaves Ho Chi Minh City and travels north, passing the industrial parks of Dien Hoa, and then a curving offshoot of the Chian Reservoir. Saigon's water supply. The air becomes fresher, cooled by the shade of rubber and teak plantations. About two and a half hours after leaving Saigon, one reaches a crossing in the Dong Nai River. On the opposite bank, reachable by foot road boats and a small ferry, is Katyan National Park. In Vietnam, this is the only place that has this ecosystem. After reunification, our state decided to make this place into a protected area, and now it's become a national park. In this park, there are many kinds of animals that are not found in other places. There are boscaris, different kinds of deer and muntjac, green peafowl, and also different kinds of waterfowl, which are rare. Starting in 1962, the Vietnamese government began protecting Vietnam's unique ecosystems and endangered creatures by putting aside national parks and protected areas. Now, in the year 2000, there are 11 national parks and 64 nature reserves throughout the country. Protecting more than 73,000 hectares in three different provinces, Dong Nai, Lam Dong, and Binh Phuc, Katyan National Park is one of Vietnam's largest national parks. The park is broken into two nearly equal-sized pieces, Katyan to the south and Cat Lok to the north, 
separated from each other by a 10 kilometer strip of small towns and farm country. The Dongnai River runs alongside both the northern and southern portions of the park. With forested hills, minority villages, a broad river, bird-filled wetlands, and a thick lowland rainforest, Katian has been called Vietnam's Amazon jungle. We're up before dawn, driving from the southern to the northern part of the park to explore the home of the rarest large mammal on Earth, Rhinoceros sundiacus animiticus, the Vietnamese rhinoceros. Our jeep swerves to avoid a porcupine out on some urgent early morning business. We pause to watch a banded crate, one of the world's most venomous snakes, sliding silently into the darkness. The sky is starting to lighten as we reach a ferry crossing on the Dong Nai River. After coffee in the town of Katian, we continue north along increasingly busy country roads. Entering Kat Lok, we cross a small suspension bridge and pass neat fields of rice, corn, beans, coffee, and cashews. Unlike the southern portion of the park, Catlock includes inside its boundaries a number of villages and about 6,000 people, more than half of them from minority groups who lived in these wooded hills and valleys for generations. A boat meets us at the river's edge. We're heading upriver to talk with Kamot, a young minority village elder with three wives. Like many men in Catlock, he used to hunt in the forest to feed his family. Powering our way upstream, we pass scattered minority homesteads and the forested hills, which are home to the tiny remaining population of Vietnamese rhinos. After elephants, rhinos are the second largest land animal in the world. Only a century or two ago, the Asian species Rhinoceros sundiacus ranged all over Southeast Asia and India. But now these rhinos exist in only two protected places, a national park in Indonesia and here in Kat Lok, the northern portion of Vietnam's Katian National Park. There are about 60 rhinos in the Indonesian park, but the Vietnamese subspecies is almost gone. Hunting, warfare, and most importantly, the cutting of forests for lumber and for more and more farms have squeezed the Vietnamese rhinos into a single small habitat here in Cat Lung. Their population is now guessed to be five to eight individuals. A single fire or food shortage and this animal would be gone forever from Vietnam and from the world. No one has seen the Vietnamese rhinos for more than a decade. These photos were taken last year using a flash camera attached to a tree triggered automatically as the rhinos pass through an infrared beam. Mountain-dwelling minority people like Mr. Kamot recall sightings of large groups of Vietnamese rhinos in the past. He tells of his father and uncle spotting a group one morning 50 years ago. Both of them climbed to the top of a tree to see them, and they realized these weren't wild buffaloes. They were rhinos. So my father counted their number by breaking a little branch into pieces, and that's how we knew there were 37. Because of the American war, there was much damage to the forest. The Americans sprayed a poison chemical to kill the forest during the period of 1962 to 1969. And then it stopped, but the American troops came into the place for fighting, and in this area a lot of people died. The end of the war didn't stop the destruction of the rhino's forest habitat. Following reunification, many settlers moved into heavily forested areas around Katien and cut a large amount of the forest to make agricultural cropland. Fortunately, the government soon realized the problems with destroying the forests and instituted new policies to keep forests as a heritage for the country. But by this time, Vietnam's rhino population was nearly gone. The last time people saw these creatures with their own eyes was more than a decade ago. 
1989, a rhino gave birth at the mineral stream. The rhinos stayed there for a week, and then they moved up the hill. Everybody here knew about them, even my children. They all saw the rhinos. We follow Kayang to the spot where the mother and baby were seen years ago. But first he and other forest guards want to show us another spot some distance away, the mud wallow where last year's photos were taken. The rhinos have been here recently. A forest guard points to their hoof prints in the mud. Over the past several years, he and other forest guards have poured wet plaster into the prints so that researchers can look for clues about the surviving individual rhinos. Kayang now takes us to the stream where he and others watched the mother rhino and her baby. When the sun rose, they would come out to be in the sun and play in the sun until 11 or 12. And then they moved up here where they drank water. Everybody saw them. Minority people, king people. Whoever wanted to see got to that point over there. We just watched them for fun. Protecting Katyan's creatures in the forest which is their home isn't easy. It requires political support, money, good planning and organization, scientific knowledge, and a sensitivity to the needs of the local people living in and around the park. Above all, it requires the personal dedication that comes from a deep love for the complexities and mysteries, the peace and the beauty of the wild forest. Katian National Park lies between two biological zones. One side is the Chungsan Mountains and the other is the Mekong Delta. Because of its position, it has very rich vegetation. From our first statistical surveys, we have 1,800 different kinds of plants and five different kinds of forest. And it also has to maintain the water resource for the Chian Reservoir, which is one of the biggest hydroelectric power generating plants in the country. Without the Katian forest, the threat to the Chian Reservoir would be serious. Because of its rich vegetation, the Katian forest is home to a wide range of creatures. From our first statistical survey on birds, we have 326 species. Among these, 20 species are in Vietnam's Red Book. We have 77 species of mammals, 25 of which are in the Red Book. The river fish system is very rich. There are seven species in the Red Book out of 71 species here. We have 14 species of amphibian. Katian National Park, beside being rich in biodiversity, is a beautiful spot. There are big trees in the forest that have strange, beautiful shapes which only nature can create. And because we're protecting the forest well, the animals are living happily in this area. You can easily see them, even in daytime on the road. And these wild animals are very friendly. Even if they see you, they just walk slowly back into the forest without running. And because of the 90 kilometers of the Dong Nai River running along the boundaries of the park, we have a lot of waterfalls, which adds to the beautiful environment. But this environment needs protection. In particular, it needs protection from those who would cut its forest to create new farmland or sell its rare woods illegally. And it needs protection from those who would trap and hunt its creatures for the local and Chinese medicinal trade, or for the sale of caged birds and animals throughout the country, or for meat in Vietnamese restaurants featuring wild game. Katian has been unusually successful in protecting its diverse ecosystem, in large part due to the dedication of Katian's hundred strong unit of forest guards. Patrolling the forest military style, these men track down and arrest many of those who violate the park's regulations against hunting and logging. This path leads to the Dong Nai River, and it passes through many swamps and lakes. It's quite far from the station, seven or eight kilometers by foot, and it's impossible to make the trip back to the station in the same day, so we have to stay overnight. If there's a small violation, such as collecting bamboo or collecting thatch, then we would give the violators a warning and talk with them about protecting the forest. And for the bigger violations, such as organized illegal logging, then after arresting the violators, we take them to the police. Basically, we've been successful at stopping serious illegal logging, but there are still many small violations. 
and for education on the environment for the local people, we provide lots of documents on environmental issues and also about the laws relating to forest protection to help the local people have knowledge. Every time when I'm on duty to raise the awareness of the people on environmental issues, I would tell them the forest has been our home for a long, long time. The floods and droughts happen because we cut the forest down. When there's no forest, there's nothing to exchange the oxygen. There's nothing to keep the soil from sliding down. And because there's no forest, when the rain comes, there's nothing to stop the water. For example, each size tree can hold a certain number of liters of water, and so it helps hold the water from the rain and to prevent floods. And also the forest can stop the water so the dirt won't go down into the river and then the bottom of the river won't be raised. When I'm going to talk, I say that in Indonesia or in Africa they have droughts and are losing crops because the water table has been going down at a serious rate. And all of this the effect of burning forest and it affects the whole world. It's not only their problem, it's also the whole planet's problem. And that's why WWF, the EU, and some of the American organizations are focusing on protecting forests. Because losing forests would cause a problem not only where the forest is, but also for the whole world. This protection is not without cost. In the 10 years since the forest guards began their work in this forest, nine of them have lost their lives. One shot by illegal loggers, the others dead from drowning or malaria. Katyan National Park is huge, 73,000 hectares of mountains, wetlands, and dense forests. And in addition to having thousands of villagers living within its borders, it's surrounded by more than 150,000 farmers and townspeople, many of them poor. Kauai and his fellow forest guards number only 100, not enough to effectively protect the park from those in the park and in the buffer zone the land immediately surrounding the park's borders, who must do what they can to feed their families. There are lots of places where people's living conditions are very poor, so they have to go inside the forest to exploit it, maybe logging, maybe hunting animals for their livelihood. I decided to go talk to the people to understand their lives. I told them if I were in this situation, I'd go chopping down trees as they do, because there's no other way to raise a family. I asked them why they were chopping the forest down. They answered, if I don't chop the trees down, what would I feed my children? So I asked them, how can we protect the forest? They said simply, if we have food, then we don't need to go to the forest. If we have only punishments and fines, or only propaganda, without improving life and giving benefit to poor people, then it would be really difficult to ask, why don't they protect nature? The Katian National Park staff devotes much thought and effort to improving the living conditions of thousands of families living in the park and in the buffer zone around the park. At community meetings, people from different villages and communes near the park outline their needs and together with park staff and local leaders, draw up detailed plans for improving their lives. Following these plans, the park has been helping develop buffer zone roads and irrigation reservoirs, as well as assisting communities around the park with a variety of different small-scale income-generating enterprises. Mrs. Dao Tihung and a number of neighboring women are part of a park program which gives loans and technical assistance to women who want to raise chickens commercially. Besides the program for raising chickens for women, there are also programs on mulberry gardens, planting fruit trees, and two plots of a new rice strain. All the activities we're doing focus on protecting Katian National Park improving the life of the people so they don't need to go to the forest and live on the forest products. I myself used to go inside the forest because of our poor living conditions, but for the last several years, I don't need to go anymore. We're visiting an in-house silkworm farm, another income-generating program supported by the park's community development office. This is a remarkably profitable business, requiring little land or startup capital. 
In less than a month, a farmer can hatch a box of silkworm eggs, feed the voracious young worms with mulberry leaves easily grown in his garden outside, provide them with a place to spin their cocoons, and then sell the cocoons to a small silk factory nearby. Fifty to seventy-five dollars profit for a half hectare of mulberry plants, some inexpensive bamboo racks, and less than a month's work. Just down the road, the small privately owned silk factory provides more buffer zone jobs. If this factory wasn't here, then all our women wouldn't have anything to do except farming. And farming gives us a very low income. Like this year, the dry season lasted too long. All the rice was damaged. The mulberries and the silkworms are now at the highest level of development they've ever been. Another park-assisted project gives buffer zone farmers a caretaker's salary for preserving the forest near their homes by frequently checking its condition and reporting violations to the authorities. After one year of being a forest caretaker, I have a good understanding about protecting nature and protecting the environment. I think it's very interesting and useful when we citizens know that we protect the natural resources and the environment for the whole country. And it helps us get some income so our lives are better. Besides helping raise incomes in the communities in and around the park's boundaries, the park supports environmental awareness classes in the nearby schools, so the younger generation will grow up appreciating nature and will feel strongly about preserving it. The A1 team has a question, which is, please say the names of all the endangered animals in Nam Katien. There are five endangered animals in Nam Katien, which are the one-horned rhino, the orange-breasted partridge, the tiger, the white-winged duck, and the Siamese crocodile. About the Siamese crocodile, they used to be seen at Boso, but now they're not seen anymore. Grade school students are not the only ones interested in learning about Katyan's rich biodiversity. Scientific researchers from all over Vietnam and from around the world come to Cat Yen to help catalog and understand this forest's vast variety of living creatures. You need to have a really a dried specimen in front of you because you normally cannot work with a living material. It will only stay alive for a short period of time. So, so you need to have a permanent record of a plant. That's, that's the purpose of making these herbarium uh, specimens. You must be aware that uh, there are still a lot of new species you find in these forests of Vietnam like anywhere in Southeast Asia. But the uh, problematic part is you not only find new species, you also lose species because of forest destruction. Dr. Puff is on a weeks-long research expedition inside Cat Tien and other Vietnamese forests with one of the country's most respected authorities on medicinal plants, Dr. Vo Ben Chi. Another member of their research team, Dr. Chan Hung, tells of modern pharmacology's interest in the uses of wild plants as traditional medicines. Right now, when we're sick, we prefer to be treated by modern pharmacology. People in the city will go to a pharmacy and buy pills, for example, paracetamol or other pills. What we think we understand is, all these pills are made in a chemistry laboratory. Now, we often think that traditional medicine is for unsophisticated people who don't know better, and that their knowledge is obsolete and not suited to modern life. But the fact is, according to the World Health Organization, 80% of modern medicine, one way or another, comes from traditional medicines. Only 20% of them are really wholly created in the lab. From that, we can see that nature has an important role for human beings, because there are still many diseases that can't be cured by existing medicines. If we have a valuable plant and we lose its genes, there is no way the next generation would have it. So we're protecting the genetic resources so our next generation can have the permanent use of it. But if we chop it down and lose its genes, then even though we know it has a high value, we've got no way to recover it. Some scientists focus on whole ecosystems rather than just one group of plants or animals. 
Belgian environmental engineer Jan Wietak is working to get international recognition and protection for Katyan's wetlands. Why are wetlands important? People mostly think wetlands are wastelands and they are useless. They uh, connect wetlands with, you know, diseases, with mosquitoes, with malaria. They think about flooding, they think uh, lands that only can be drained so people can use them to, for agriculture or to build houses on them. But in fact, uh, wetlands are very important in our ecosystem. They feed underground aquifers. So they can also um, have a value in the detoxification of um, toxic chemicals because in the water, you know, there are a lot of bacteria who can break down chemicals. Also very important is the ecological value. There are um, staging ground or wintering ground for birds, a lot of birds. They um, also for a lot of animal, other animals like mammals. If you go around the lakes, it's full of footprints, so they are also important for fish. If you go to the water, you see lots of lots of fish. Butterfly fauna is um, very diverse in Vietnam. The amount of butterfly species is not less than 1,000. How many new species for the five last year? We found in Vietnam more than 30 new taxa. It means new species and new subspecies, which uh, never ever been found in other countries. Professor Va Kui is known throughout Vietnam and the world, both for his research in ornithology and for his work in protecting Vietnam's rich and diverse biological heritage. Like his French counterpart Jacques Cousteau, he has been tireless in his efforts to inspire people everywhere with his wonder at the intricacy of ecological systems. In the forest, the ants eat all the dead animals, or they eat the other tiny living creatures. And the termites only eat the decomposing wood, and then the material they've eaten changes form. If it weren't for these little creatures, then the whole forest would fill up with dead animals, which the vegetation can't take up as nutrients. Each organism in the system has its niche to grow and live in. It has its living condition, it has its nutrition, and then another kind of organism controls its population. So in the ecosystem, each organism controls the growth of other populations, and in turn has its own population controlled by still other organisms. And this then keeps the whole ecosystem in balance. But if we interfere and cause the extinction of any organism, then the ecosystem is unbalanced and it's transformed. Another of Dr. Kui's roles is as teacher and mentor to generations of students. Wen Chan Vi has a master's degree in ornithology. Dr. Kui was his teacher and continues to advise the young scientist as he begins his career. If everybody thinks this species is interesting, that one is beautiful, and wanted to put them in cages so we can watch them easily every time we want, then imagine the population of Vietnam is 77 million. And if everybody has the same idea of taking them, would there be enough birds to do so? Right now, environmentalists are focusing on protecting intact natural systems, keeping everything in its natural balance. Let them live naturally in their environment, so it would give them a chance to increase their population. That's why all the protected areas in national parks were established. If we care for the parks, then we can develop ecotourism. After working hard in the big cities, visitors can come and enjoy the peacefulness of the scenes here and enjoy the clean air and watching birds in the forest. These things are good for the soul. Staying in the big city is stressful and noisy and makes your mind go crazy. Ecotourism is probably best defined as responsible travel to natural places that conserves the environment and also takes care of the welfare of the local people. We only have to look at countries such as Costa Rica, um, South Africa, where ecotourism is quite developed now. Um, and you can see the benefits that, that Vietnam could, could reap in the future. 
at the present time, most eco tourists are from overseas, foreigners. But there will come a time when a lot of Vietnamese will also be eco tourists and they'll want to go and explore these places. For park visitors, whether from overseas or here at home, there are comfortable, reasonably priced accommodations and a cheerful restaurant staff serving good Vietnamese dishes with no wild game on the menu in a rustic bamboo and thatch canteen. Visitors can rent rugged trail bikes, kayaks with paddles and life vests, or jeeps and trucks suitable for the park's unpaved roads. Among those rushing to greet the rainy season visitor to Cat Tien's forest trails are hungry leeches. Leeches are part of the tropical forest, but they're nothing to be scared of because we have medicine and special leggings to prevent leeches. You can use this DEP medicine, put it around the leggings, and when the leeches get in that circle, they automatically drop off. You'll be safe. Nothing scary. A real threat to Katyan, however, is uncontrolled migration, which could overcrowd the buffer zone with new settlers desperate for income and land. A stable and prosperous buffer zone is the key to success. We're training local people so in the future they themselves can take care of the visitors who come to the park instead of keeping them in the park's housing. With city people, sometimes they're growing up in the big city without knowing about life in the countryside. So if they go to the park and stay with a family, eat with a family, live in the same house and then work on a farm sometimes with the same family, it would be very interesting for them. We're in a speedboat tourists can rent at park headquarters, heading down the Dong Nai River to Dalai, the only village inside the southern portion of the park. After greetings from village kids, the head of the town people's committee, local patrons at a riverside cafe, an elderly former hunter who used to wear elephant tusks in his earlobes, a girl on a bicycle, and a bunch of kids with a lively dog, we arrive at another of the park's income generating projects. It's a longhouse full of women weaving traditional chow ma cloth on the footlooms their mothers and grandmothers used to weave all chow ma clothing on. It was a nearly forgotten art until the park's community development staff pointed out that the women of Talai were letting an opportunity slip through their fingers. The park hired a local teacher, created a production space, and has been helping market the women's output, both at park headquarters and as far away as Hanoi's Christmas Crafts Bazaar. We are very proud because we can learn to have a job and we will try our best to learn and to protect the forest. We are afraid of losing natural environment and afraid of losing all the precious natural heritage in the forest. And our children might not know about all these things in the future. Her husband, Kawai, the forest guard whom we've spoken with before, has some thoughts for us before we leave. The forest has been our home for a long, long time, since our ancestors. And then during the war we followed Uncle Ho. We were brave and strong to liberate the country then. So now our government has a policy of protecting this forest as part of our heritage, our history. The river is still. The sun is setting as we motor back upriver at the end of the day. It's the kind of time and place when the mind wanders peacefully, asking questions we often have no time for. Why should we be careful to preserve wild places like Katyan National Park? What does it really matter to the great majority of us who live far from wild areas if the biodiversity held in forests like this is lost. Watching a pair of ducks swinging low over the river, the shapes of the trees silhouetted against the glowing sky, many answers come. One is, many of the creatures in forests like this are unique to our country and are part of Vietnam's heritage and Vietnam's contribution to the world. Who knows what new cures for disease can be found here? or will be lost if this forest is lost. Also, 
The forest at Kat Tien prevents soil erosion, which would clog the Qian Reservoir just downstream. As the watershed for Ho Chi Minh City's main reservoir, this forest captures and purifies the water used by Vietnam's largest population center. And directly affecting the livelihoods of millions and the economy of the whole country, Vietnam's forests help stabilize the climate, moderating floods and droughts. As the air cools and another day ends in the forest, a last thought comes to mind. While places like Cat Tien are deeply important to us personally, they're what shaped us, where we came from. They give us something ancient, mysterious, and huge to share with our children, and something essential for our own souls as well. <laughs>